It's that time of the day, certainly my favourite time of the day, the GB News pub is fully open. It's Talking Pints, and I'm joined by music impresario, Pete Waterman. Pete, welcome. Cheers, thank you. Now, we all know you, Stock Aitken Waterman, these amazing, unbelievable number of successes that you had, hundreds of hit records, unbelievable what you did. But what's really interesting are the jobs you did before, before all of that. I mean, just run us through some of the jobs that you did when you were young. Well, I was a grave digger. You grave digger, yeah. Not for long, but I was a grave digger. Yeah. I went down the pit. Um, I worked on the railway as a fireman. And I worked in the telecommunications industry as a, a, a technician. What was it like working down the pit? Well, it's a great story, this. I went down the pit and I got to the bottom. I was, at the time, I was well overweight. And I got to the bottom and the guy said, you're a bit of a big lad to be down here. I've got a job for you on top, making cement. So I actually only spent about an hour downstairs and then I was on the top <laughs> making cement. And I went from about 17 and a half stone to about 11 stone in about eight weeks. Don't think I've ever worked so hard in my life. It's dreadful. What, making cement? That, that was physically very hard work. Yeah, it was mixing. You know, I got a big mixer. Yeah. It was called No Fines. In other words, there was no sand in it. You had to put like a coat in, like a... Um, a chocolate bar, and it was a way that water permeated through the concrete onto a membrane and went down drains. And you worked on the railways for a bit. I did, yep. And you are a sort of full-on railway nut, basically. Uh, yeah, like you could say that, yeah. Would have been, I think, would have been cheaper if I did drugs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've invested in all sorts of railways. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a... I've travelled by train all my life. Yep. Um, didn't drive till I was about 26, 27. I've commuted by, tr by train for, since 1972, 71. Yep. I still do three or four train journeys a week. I do not understand why people drive cars. Although I have a very nice car and I sometimes have to drive it because it's the only place I can get. I, I, I have used public transport all my life and, and, and I've, I've found it perfectly fit for purpose. They Home for you, the West Midlands, obviously. That was, yeah. I live in the northwest now. But very much where... Well, this is even more relevant, right? Because right. I had the Conservative Member of Parliament for Litchfield sitting where you're sitting the other day. And we were talking about trains, and in particular HS2, and the cost of it. And his argument was, Michael Fabrigan's argument was, well, actually, from Litchfield to London, is only like an hour and 15 minutes anyway, that from Manchester to London, I think the fastest trains are two hours, six minutes, seven yeah, minutes, yeah, yeah. That, that actually, is it really worth spending 100, 150 billion quid? And he's the MP for Litchfield, is he? He's the MP for Litchfield, yeah. Well, he ain't very bright then, is he? Well, you tell me, because I'm well, not convinced. Well, OK. Uh, where's Coventry compared with Litchfield? Oh, Further south, right? Yeah, 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 of course. Well, I can tell you now that yeah. Coventry from Euston is exactly one hour, 100 miles exactly, mm -hmm. right? Crew on HS2 is 58 minutes. Crew's farther up north than Litchfield ever will be, by yeah, a long way. Does saving 10 minutes matter that much? No, it's not saving 10 minutes, Nigel. Crew is yeah. currently one hour yes. and 35 minutes. Well, oh, 35 minutes, yeah, sorry. It's yeah, gonna sorry. Save, yeah, it's going to save 38 minutes. But more important, it moves, co it moves crew from the North Midlands... Mm -hmm. To the South Midlands. It puts it right at the heart. So it'll drive more business to London? No, it'll drive more business like me back to... I, listen, I, I, I got this job because I could commute in under an hour. I didn't need to buy a house in London, so I came back, but I took my wealth back to the Midlands. Yeah. And when I, when I really started this, what did I open my studios? In Manchester. All right, so you're an HS2 enthusiast then? Yeah, absolutely. It's a big cost, isn't it? No, it's cheap. No, it's not cheap. It's cheap. Oh, well, how's it Come cheap? on, how much has this pandemic cost us? And what have we got out of it? Oh, I know that. Nothing. Well, I know that. We haven't got anything out of it. But isn't Where's the point? 20,000 jobs? Nigel, our problem Let's, is in... That uh, amount of money could be spent on infrastructure projects all over the United Kingdom. No, it couldn't. It could not benefit... We cannot modernise the railway with, with patching it up. You've got places like Primrose Hill Tunnel. You've got Killsby Tunnel. These tunnels are so big and so... It's restrictive, they stop us. It, it is a bit Victorian, some of the systems. It's a yeah. complete no, I get Victorian. That. I get that, I get that. I just look at the massive cost of it. But, no, but anyway, you well, are... Let's talk about the massive cost, but, right? But, you know, we, we, could, could I was on transport for the... You it know, could be 150 a, billion quid, yeah. OK, but I was a, a director of Transport for the North, one of the first directors yep. on Transport for the North. 
I know how much subsidy the Treasury has to put into the North West to keep it afloat, OK? It's huge compared with what it has to put in London and the South East. London and the South East is this amazing place which pays for most of us to live. Well, let's put a bit more into the North East, the North West, the Midlands, because then it will generate more. If I mean, it did, if it did, if I really thought it would, I might change my mind. But I'll tell you what puts me off ever so slightly. The TGV in right. France, all right? You know, I spent lots of time in France as an MEP, go to Strasbourg and all the rest of it. When I was first elected to the European Parliament, it was five hours from Paris to Strasbourg. By the time I left the European Parliament, it was two hours, 14 minutes. I mean, completely different. Yeah. Um, Bigger country, though. Yeah, no, no. Marseille was six hours from Paris, but with the TGV, it was three hours from Paris. And Lyon, correspondingly, again, much, much closer. And the experience in France was that a lot more businesses in Marseille headquartered in Paris than they had before. It drove business into Paris. Now, if it works the other way around here, okay. I get the point, but I'm, okay. I'm but not we, sure. We have... A, ah, right, well, let's take Warrington, where I live. Yep. As a unique place. Unique. More people come into Warrington to work than going to Manchester or Liverpool. That's because Warrington has built a case around a nuclear industry. So if you look at Warrington, yeah. there's more people go in than go out and they all the jobs. And good roads. Yes. Around Warrington, the roads are. Right. You know, because are good. there's a great industry. Yeah. Yeah. So it proves that if you do build it, which is why I work so hard to get crew as the first you know, hub for HS2, because yeah. it opens the whole of the North West, so North Wales. When this is completed, it'll stop in Birmingham, it'll yep. stop in Crewe, yep. and then Manchester. And then we hope Liverpool and Warrington will come off on a spur. And then there was the line that was going to go up to Leeds, wasn't there? The... You know, Nigel, that's the problem. And I'll tell you why it's a problem. It's not a problem of the cost or what it is. It's a problem of the people that that live in that part of the world that don't want it built, that can't see like we did in the North West, like Andy Burnham and, and, and the people in Crewe and Warrington and, and Liverpool. We see there's a massive benefit for, for bringing it there. When I was on the commission for the Treasury, that we went round Britain looking at the value that we could get yeah. this, we found absolute apathy, and I mean apathy, in the East Midlands and Yorkshire. It was just, they didn't want to know. No. So if they don't want to know... You're not going to get it. <laughs> if you don't fight for it, you're not going to get it, are you? Well, Pete, I have to say, your passion for this is, is it's real. It's very, very, oh, very it's strong. Real, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm still not totally convinced, but you've put the argument and I'm I'm very, very pleased to hear it. But when you were doing all these different jobs, the grave digging and cement making and briefly going down the pit and all the rest of it, collecting records, this was this was clearly I mean, were you kind of... Rock and roll was just really kicking off, I guess, in the late 50s, or...? Well, I started collecting, I think, in truth. I remember, like, buying a Woolworths um, radio with, you know, two earphones. I was about, I was about, I guess, six or seven, eight. Got it for Christmas, and I could go in, you know, into bed. And my mum didn't know this, because she'd have died <laughs> if she thought I was in bed listening to the radio. <laughs> but I used to listen to American Forces Network, yep. Radio Luxembourg, and, and stations like that. Um... And I started to collect, you know, the records that you heard. Um, and they fascinated me. The cultural thing really fascinated me. And um, I was lucky enough that my, I had an auntie who lived in Leicestershire. Of course, the nuclear strike force in those days was at Bruntingthorpe and Upper Hayford, which were very much within my patch. And my mum and dad used to go to a pub at the end of the runway at Bruntingthorpe. And the American GIs used to come out and they used to bring the records from the jukebox and give them to my mum because they play Skittles in the pub. Uh, and so I started collecting these American records, you know. And then, you know, you start doing parties because you've got these records that kids don't know. So you're in demand? Yeah. I get ten bob and a, you know, a, barrel, a barrel of beer, you know, one of them <laughs> tanks, what they were called bumper packs. The worst beer in the world, weren't they? Bloody awful. Was it Watney's or whatever? Oh, <laughs> God, <laughs> family packs, I think. You know, you sit in the corner and play records, you know, and I got ten bob. Well, my dad was probably earning, I don't know, six, five, six, seven quid in the factory. I was getting ten bob for playing records at the, you know, that I loved. So I thought, well, there's got to be something in this. And when does the, when does the real revolution start? When I met the Beatles. Is it the Beatles? Oh, yeah, without question. I mean, that's. 60, 62, 3? 62. 
Yeah. yeah I, you know, I, I was at their first gig as, as the Beatles. I'd been John Lennon and the Silver Beatles the night before. Yep. They were on the back, way back from Hamburg to um, Liverpool, and they stopped in a... a so you're just there as a fan? No, yes, I was there as a fan. Yeah. Um, I, I called in at the Matrix Ballroom. Remember the Matrix Tools? They used to have a ballroom, which was a social club. And uh, they were on there, on their way back. And I, I'd never seen anything like them. I mean, I'd worked with lots of acts and seen lots of acts at that point. But, you know, these four lads went on stage, and Ringo Starr still wasn't with them at that point. And they just went on stage and went, one, two, three, four. And I, I went, what? It was like, whoa, what is this? It was like... I guess like punk was. It was so energetic, so different. And, you know, they had Levi jeans on. Well, we didn't see Levi jeans in Coventry. I mean, you know, only Americans <laughs> wore Levi jeans. My God, they've got Levi jeans on. You know, and this guitarist had a Jet Atkins Gretsch. It's like, wow, this guy's got a Gretsch, you know. They must be American. Couldn't understand them anyway because they taught, you know, from Liverpool. So it was like, but there were, it was just an impact. It was like, okay. Yeah. This is giving me goosebumps. Why is it giving me goosebumps? Because this is what I, I want to do. You know, this is like. But it took off, didn't it? Oh, then you know, people forget, and you try. You know, I do lecture occasionally. Just colleges. There was no social media. No. BBC didn't we had the home service and the light program. You know, and within three weeks of me seeing them at the and no radio one, no radio one. Within three, no pirate radio at all. Only Radio Luxembourg. Uh, within three weeks, they played at the Nuneaton Co-op Hall, and it was packed. I mean, packed. So between, just in three weeks, they'd gone from probably 40 people at the venue that I was at yeah. till 2,500. And, of course, then within a month and a half, all the daily papers have picked up Beatlemania. Amazing. And yeah. you decide, this is it. Yeah, this is it. I've got to be in music. Yeah, because you... you but you how look, do you, as, as someone that's not coming with any particular advantages to all of this, how do you go to where you got to in the 80s? I mean, how does all that happen? You just decide to do it. Simple as that? Yeah, because I can't read and write. So this is the other thing I was fascinated by. No, I couldn't read or write, so I couldn't be told. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing was different. You know, I didn't know you, you couldn't do this. I didn't understand that there were barriers to this. I just never understood that. Because to me, there were no barriers. You know, when I, when I saw these band, you know, the Beatles play, and they played things like Mr. Moonlight and um, Hippie Hippie Shake, well, I've got these records that I've been playing for months, you know, and it's like, well, they're doing what I do. They, they're, they're obviously talented enough to do it on a guitar, but I've got the records, so I can make people as entertained. So I didn't see that whole thing about... Uh, you can't do this because you've got to go to work at half past seven in the morning. Mm. It's like, no, 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 I'll go half past seven in the morning. That's fascinating. But if I've got to get home for one o'clock, I'll get home. And you finish up, stock Aki Waterman, and you've got the lot, haven't you? You know, Banana, Rama, and all these big hits. And how many top ten hits did you... Oh, God, 22 number ones, I think, yeah. 22 number ones. Was it all just mass market, easy... No, it was hard work. Was it, was it good music or was it, was it just commercial music? It's still around now. So, no, I only make commercial music. Yeah. I don't make music people to judge me by. I don't, that's not what I'm interested in. They either like it or they don't. I don't like I, Listen, I need their cash. Yep. Pay me in, <laughs> pay me in cash, don't pay me in gold watches. This is... It's like Mozart. Is. It's like, I, don't, you won't offend me by giving me a fiver. OK, so if you don't want to review my records, that's fine. Just, you know... I always said to people that, that, that gave me all this grief, hang on, I walk down the street, kids walk up to me and say... When's the next Banana Rama album, man? Yeah. In other words, yeah. when can I give you another fiver? <laughs> How many people are lucky enough to walk down the street and kids say, no, would you like a fiver? Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's amazing. And how have you found living with that kind of fame? Easy, actually, Nigel. If you don't, don't want it, you don't go out. You stay in. Yeah. When you go out, you're in the public And domain, people want to talk to you the whole time. And people want to talk to you. Yeah then that's what you've got to do. That's what you get paid yeah. to do. Yeah. If you don't want to go out, I don't go out. You know, when I go out on the railway, people talk to me because they know that, you know, they've got an opinion about the railway. Not everything the railway does is perfect, but it does in the majority of cases. You know, we've just had this whole fiasco at the weekend where they're trying to save the planet. Well, we've been, you know, on the railway, we've been, let's be honest, we've been... Penny pinching, we've been, you know, recycling carriages for the last 75 years. Are you a bit sceptical about net zero, then? I'm sceptical about people that turn up 
in entourages, private jets, private yachts, well, and try and tell me <laughs> that they're here to save the planet. And, you know, I'm listening to the BBC about climate change, and then they have a programme about going to Mars, <laughs> you know, and having private flights around the Earth. You're going, hang on a minute, whoa, wait a minute. If we, if we take it serious, well, let's take it serious. Yeah. But then we're too far along the line now of blurring the lines between what you can recycle and what is and what isn't proper. In other words, big business can come in, in front too many times of practicalities. Mm. I mean, we do things on the railway now. Ten years ago, we would have never thought about doing. Well, who would have known? Who would have known that getting Pete Waterman in, we get a lecture about railways, we'd be told all about the Beatles in the early days, and a guy who's achieved that level of success, who, as he says, couldn't read and write properly. Amazing. Pete Waterman, thank you for joining me here on Talking Pints.